come praying? Yep. Did you come expecting? Did you? Yeah. I've seen two or three heads run up and down. Okay. Do you know the revival back in 1971 in Saskatoon, our song leader was 85 years old, Dr. Virgil Brown. His voice was cracked, and he was sometimes off key. But he was so full of the love of God, nobody even noticed, you know. And you know, he actually, at one point, he went on, on the road, after he was in Saskatoon, he started barnstorming around the country, preaching and singing, you know. Just a great man of God. And one day I said to him, there's an old man, he lives right back of our church, he's 90-something, 90 95, would you like to go with me and try and win him to the Lord? Let's go, he said, you know. Now, don't forget it. I sat here, the man sat here, and the virtual box sat here. And he explained the gospel to him. Then he got to his feet and walked over and stood in front of him, and here's what he said. Now, are you willing to receive Christ as your personal Savior? If you are, get to your feet and give me your hand. And he got to his feet and gave him his hand, you know. That was so neat. Virgil's in heaven now, of course, but a um, wonderful man of God. 85, you know, you don't have an 85-year-old man for a song leader, right? You just don't do that. But that's how it worked out. I have a couple of texts for this morning. One is Psalm 8, verse 6, point verse. It says, Love is as strong as death. You ever thought of that verse before? Love is as strong as death. How strong is death? You know, there are people who apparently die, all the vital life signs are gone, and they're pronounced dead. But they're not really dead, and they may come back to life again. We have numerous accounts, I have several books in my library on that subject. It's very interesting to read about. There's a part, there's an unseen, an unseen umbilical cord. And if that breaks, you never come back. Then that's death. Love is as strong as death. And then in 1 Corinthians 8, one of the verse that says, Knowledge puffs up. But love builds up. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Try not to the famous evangelist to whom God probably won a million souls to Christ. Not long before he died, he was addressing a group of 400 pastors, and among other things, he said this. He said, brethren. Hold the churches to love, because that's where we've gone wrong. Because you can see there are places where there have been powerful revivals and hundreds, maybe thousands converted, and yet some years later there didn't seem to be much evidence of it. And in trying to assess the problem, this is what he came up with. Hold the churches to love. That's where we missed the boat. That's where we've gone wrong. I think that's certainly very very true today. The statement, God is love, is given twice in 1 John. God doesn't have to try to love. I've heard of some people who were having some relatives come for a weekend, relatives that they really didn't like. And they didn't know how they were going to put up with them, so you know what the two of them did? They practiced smiling in front of a mirror. You know, so they could give them big smiles of phony baloney, but this was on sometimes. God is love. He never has to try love. He is love. And everything he does is guided by his love. Everything. Second Peter 1 is a verse that says that we have become partakers of God's divine nature. What is his nature? What is it? Love. It's love. And we have become partakers of love. Okay, we have become partakers of God's design nature, that is, we have become partakers of love, the love of God. 
greater song than tongue or pen can ever tell. Ephesians 1 4 says, We were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. You were chosen to be a loving person. So was I. Now sometimes people say, Well, that's not really my nature. I'm not that kind of an outgoing person. I just don't have it. Well, you better get it, that. If you don't have it, you better get it. Because you're a Christian. The world expects something of Christians, you know. Oftentimes they're disappointed. They were chosen to be a loving person. That's not just for specific occasions, but for the whole of life. It says, let all your things be done with love. Everything. Let all your things be done with love. Okay. It's the goal of Christ's teaching. You know, I was thinking one day, wouldn't it be great if you could go back in time and just sneak into a meeting where Christ was training the twelve? Well, I really couldn't. One day God gave me a verse that really helped me. In John 17, 26, Christ said, He was praying, remember, to His heavenly Father, I have declared unto them, that's the twelve, I have declared unto them your name, and will declare that the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. So the goal of his teaching at all was that they might be filled with the love of God. That was his goal. That was the goal of the apostles too, because in 1 Timothy 1 5, and I know there's different translations of that, the end of the commandment is charity rising out of the pure heart. But the one I'm going to give is, and it's the same thought. The goal of our instruction is love rising out of the pure heart. So what Christ taught, the apostles taught, and we should be teaching, of course, today. Okay? The Bible says that love covers the multitude of sins. He that covers a man or seeks love, it says in Proverbs. You know. And you know, we shouldn't be a gossiper. There's a lot of them around, you know. The Black Memorial Church here in Winnipeg, when Chuck and Mr. Spender, Gerald Spender, came to be a pastor, was just gasping as the last. That building then seating 700, and they've been fighting and scrapping, and they were down to about 60 people. And I was a member there, but I was on the road preaching in bush camps and so on, so I didn't have much to do in the church. But he came, and I chaired the meeting where he came. He leaned over the pulpit, and what he said. All I'm asking for you people is 12 months and no criticism. And then he let us know, if there's one thing I hate, it's gossipers. I can't stand them. There won't be any in heaven, you know, but he said, we've got them in the churches here, you know. I mean, there's some gossipers that say it, sure. Anyway, he had a little black book. And if he heard that you gossiped, he wrote your name down, the date, and who you said, what you said to, who you said it to, you know. When you had two or three entrances in the book, he called you into his office. And he read this off. And he would say, I sat in on one of those sessions, and he handled it very lovingly, but very firmly. He would say something like this, Now, are you planning to continue this kind of activity? Because if you are, I'll accept your resignation from the church today. He told me, he said, I would rather have a dozen Broncos a member of my church than one gospel. Wow. Okay. Love covers the multitude of sins. We're not to be uncovering people's sins unless we're trying to help them. But gospel, I think God hates it too. So what happened in the church? The first year, over 100 people joined the church. And in the five years he was there, they added 500 new members. They had rallies with 12 or 1,400 people there. He told me he had a goal of 2,000 people, and I would have had it. He was really a great man of God. He loved people, had a gift from God, and knew it. And uh, the thing was killed in a plane crash. And so, the others took over. Okay. First Corinthians 13, 7 says, Love believes all things. That may 
trouble believing the Bible? All the Bible? The Bible says, therefore I esteem, I call, all your precepts, all your teachings, concerning all things to be right. And I hate every false way. I hate every false way. I esteem all your teachings. Love believes all things. Because God said, that's all. Okay. Now it says in Galatians 5, 8, that faith works by love. Did you know that? Faith works by love. And that's what it says. So it must be true. And Spurgeon explained that this way. He said, faith, listen carefully, faith is the soul at rest in the love of God. You get it? Faith is the soul at rest in the love of God. Okay. It's a great thought. Second Corinthians 5.14, Paul simply said, the love of Christ constrains us. It moves us. You can't think about the love of Christ. You know, dear people, listen. It wasn't the nails that held him on the cross. It was his love for you. And his love for me. He could have been off that cross any second he chose. But he didn't. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them unto what? What does it say? Yeah. Unto the end. What an awful end. It was for the Son of God to be made sin for us. He who knew no sin that we might be made in the righteousness of God in Him. All right, the love of Christ constrains us. The Bible speaks in 2 Corinthians 8, 8 and 24 about proving the sincerity of your love. Here's the phrase, the proof of your love. And then later on in the same chapter, to prove the sincerity of your love. What's he talking about? Oh, he's talking about giving. You prove the sincerity of your love for God by what you give to God. You know? Did you know that? I mean, that's what it says if you read the chapter carefully. The proof of your love. We had a kid in our home one time and he was struggling with spirits and my wife and I were trying to help him. And we weren't making much, much progress. And then, I don't know what, I asked the question, my wife asked the question, but the question is this, are you tithing? Yes, I am. Now right beside him there was a floral lamp set on the timer, he didn't know that, and the minute he said this, the light went off. And he sat there for a minute, and he looks over to the light, well, most of the time. Okay, five bucks a month. <laughs> okay. You know, pardon my personal reference, but when I went off preaching, the, the church is a tiny church. They said they paid me thirty dollars a month if the money came in. And the tailor in the dirty thirties, you know, and um, sometimes it didn't. But we always made it. The first thing we did was this. There were two things I'll just, uh, that I'll share. We determined to give God off the top, top, every month, no matter what. The second thing we did was we never hint. If we had a need, a financial need, we never tell anybody, we never hint to anybody, we never ask for, for help from our families or anything. There's an old saying, you know, I hope you never forget if they haven't heard it before. If God knows the need, who else needs to know? You know, there's a lot of people going around and they're hinting about how poor they're off they are and they're hoping you'll give them something. And Listen, if God knows the need, who else needs to know? Doesn't he feed the sparrows? Won't he much more feed you and I quite sad? Of course he will. So you don't have to let people know what your needs are. Let God know. And we had over the years, I mean, we had an exciting time, man. Sometimes no money, but we always have the promises, you know. And we just trusted God and praise the Lord, you know. I remember one time a fellow called to see me, and um, he called about 4.30, and I knew he was hoping to be asked for supper. 
But we didn't ask him for supper. He stayed till about 7 o'clock and then he took off. He was back about a year later with a friend. And we invited him for supper. And he was a joker and he says to his friend, You know, I was here about a year ago and I was just starving, he said. Then he invited me for supper. <laughs> and I said, Russ, would you like to know why? Yeah, he said, because it's not your nature, you know. And I said, We were dead broke, we didn't have any money. Didn't have any food at that time. We got up the next day. Now, he always had probably $500 in his wallet. He was so embarrassed, you know. <laughs> but anyway, what I'm trying to say is this. You prove the sincerity of your life with the word of God says by what you give to God. And so, there are times, dear people, when we have to go beyond the time. And sometimes, maybe even far beyond the time. And every time you do whatever good thing any man does, the same shall you receive of the Lord, whether he be gone or free. You will get it back. If you give, you'll get. We don't give for that reason. Remember it says a lamb hoping for 8%? Is that what it said? Luke 6? And a lamb hoping for nothing is what it says. A lot of these things we forget. Let him that stole steal a mobile, rather than a labor. Work with hands and things which is that he may invest it at 8%. Well, it doesn't say that there either. But he may have to give to him the means. You know. Okay. Hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. 1 John 3.16. I do have notes here you can pick up afterwards. Okay. Let love be one strong man. Let love be without hypocrisy. Are we hypocritical sometimes? John said, My little children, but it's not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. We can tell people we love them and maybe they need ten dollars or twenty dollars or something. We don't, you know, do even think of that because they have such a, you know, tight grips, grasp on our money. The man on him. No man can serve two masters. One is God, the other is money. And here in North America, most of us are really gagged spiritually because we've got such a tight grasp of money. You know, we're worried because when we get to be 65, we're only going to have a little pension from the government. So, man, we've got to put a lot of money by to make sure everything will be taken care of because God will die. When I get to be 65, God's going to die. Did you know that? A fellow came to me from Florida one time. I was up in Winnipeg, and uh, here in Winnipeg, and uh, he flew all the way up, a, a Christian pastor. And his wife had left and run off with some other guy. And he was absolutely heartbroken. He wept and he could hardly tell me the story. He just wept and wept and wept and wept. And I couldn't get his attention. So finally I said to him, uh, did, did God die? Did you read an obituary about God dying? Uh, what, are you, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? I said, well, you're acting as if God died, you know. Your wife asked you, did God leave you? Is your wife's love greater than God's love? Of course not. And he saw it. And we got him out of it. And he finally left praising the Lord. Sure, it's an awful thing. Your wife takes off, your husband takes off. That's not the end of the world. Not at all. God never forsakes us in any situation. And we can know that and we should. We should know that. Let me use an illustration. You're walking down the street, you're a Christian. And you're coming to some lights, and you see a blind guy, and he's crossing the street on a green light. There they have a bell, you know, for blind people. And he's, and he, and, but he gets turned around, and, and he bumps into a car. And then he gets nervous because he knows the light's going to change. And you're standing and saying, you know, I should go and help that guy, but I just don't have that love feeling, you know. I don't have that love feeling. My if I had that love feeling, I'd rush out there and get him off the street. So you stand and watch him, and then he gets... You know, the light changes and cars are moving, he's afraid and he runs and the car hits him and kills him. And you say, no, I don't know why God didn't give me that one feeling, you know. Love is not a feeling. It's a force, a power. It's God in us that leads us to help others. And so 
sometimes in little things. We had a nice storm on our highways. It was inches. I said, at least I, I came to a place I was driving with chains on. Used to have that in the back when no chains. Sometimes they don't feel too. Anyway, kids were actually skating, playing hockey on the highway. It was not bad. So I'm coming along, here's a guy, he slid off. It wasn't really a ditch, just a little narrow depression. He was sitting there. So I stopped and said, hey, let's walk on. I've got a chain here. And I'll pull you up to the top of this hill. It wasn't much of a hill, but he couldn't make it, you know. And he, no, he pretended, no, no, no. So you go on the road. There's no way. Yeah, come on. So we hooked up, you know, and we got partly up the hill, and the chain slipped off one of the wheels, and so, but it's not in game, he begged me to stop, you know. I said, no, I'm going to get you to the top of that hill, or a bad car, you know. So I get him to the top of the hill. Gave him a gospel paper, and he was so appreciative of what had happened. He'll never forget that, you know. Just a little thing, I know. By love, serve one another. That's what the Bible says. Okay, the Bible says in this, pardon me, in Ezekiel 33 31, with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goes after their covetousness. Covetousness. Is that how it is? Is it not very with you, maybe? With their mouth, they show much love, but with their heart, their heart is chasing after covetous of money and stuff. Okay. The statement, love your neighbor as yourself, is given ten times in the scripture. Must be important, you know. Any of you hear Dr. Price on the TV? Maybe one or two of you do, yeah. He used this illustration just a short while ago, and I want to use it this morning. I didn't ask his permission. I don't think he'd mind. It was a church with about a thousand members, and they were good people, but they never did anything. And the pastor didn't know how to, how to fix this, you know. And so one Sunday morning, God gave him insight. So one Sunday morning, he went to the Pope and he said, I'm not, I'm not preaching a sermon today. I'm just going to give you a text. You're to love your neighbor as yourself. And he sat down, and nothing happened. So he got up again, went to the Pope, and he said, The text is, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he sat down. And then movement began in the congregation. People started getting up and going to other people and talking. Very soon, the whole thing was a beehive of activity. He found later that six people who were unemployed got a job that morning in the church, you know. And all kinds of great things happen. So a week or two later, he said, uh, I don't have a sermon this morning either. The sermon today is, love your neighbor as yourself. He said, the church was empty in five minutes. Where have they gone? They've gone to their neighbors. To love their neighbor, to preach the gospel to their neighbor. I mean, love your neighbor as yourself. Ten times? Probably. <laughs> It must be extremely important. Blanche Johnson, her husband, was a doctor. God touched their lives in revival. And they had a very sad thing happen. They'd gone to China on holidays. And uh, while they were there, they left their children, I think they had, was it three or four, I'm not sure now, with her parents. And one day the parents her mom and dad took the children for a walk, and a drunk teenager ran into them. The kids weren't hurt, they were on the ditch side. The mother, the grandmother, like her mother, Blanche's mother, was killed instantly. Her daddy died the next day. Now, I had an awful time finding them in China, but they did get them, they came home, and the uh, son of mine had the funeral. I wasn't, wasn't there. After the funeral, Blanche said, where is the young man that drove the car? He was in jail. And she went to the jail and asked permission to see him. And they let her in. And she said basically something like this. You killed my mom and dad and I miss them very, very much. And I really do miss them. But I want you to know that I forgive you for what you did. And I love him with the love of God. And he fell on his knees and started bawling, and she led him to Christ, you know. 
that's how we're supposed to handle things, you know. That's how, that's not easy. That is how we're supposed to do it. Paul, the church is still wrong. This is where we've gone wrong. You know, I was in Minneapolis, and I met a fellow, he had a, a very strange uh, name. His name was Justin Time. Now, that wasn't his original name. But he got saved at just in time. He was on the Sunset Strip in California, it's a place where everybody goes in drugs and stuff, and it was a great big deal. And he was in there, and one, one night he was lying there, uh, almost out, and a Christian girl came by and ministered to him, and uh, got him sober finally, and eventually they married. It was a great story, you know. And he had his name changed to just in time because he said, I got saved just in time, you know. And he was employed by the police force in, the, in Minneapolis, in St. Paul. The reason for this was because he had such a sweet, loving nature. He was really different. Just simply reaching out to everybody. And they especially called him in when they had somebody threatening suicide, tall stories about the street or something, they would get just in time in there. And he would get in there and start talking to these people who were in the world, and pretty soon he'd have them in his hand, you know. In such a sweet, loving way. Like I say, it was everybody. It wasn't put on. It was just that God had control of his heart, you know. And he wants to do the same for us. You know, sometimes we need to ask a total stranger, how's it going with you? Have we done that? Do it sometimes. You might say it's none of your business. I've never had that happen. You know. They might say, well, and they sometimes say, I'm not doing very well. And why is this? I remember one time in uh, Scotland. We were on a bus tour at the time. I had some crusades over there, and we were on a bus tour. And, and uh, they stopped for maybe five, ten minutes to have coffee, and I didn't drink coffee. And so I'm walking around. I see a guy sitting on the wall on a stone wall. Had a, cat pulled down over here and he really looked rough and I don't know and said, uh, how is it with you? Oh, he said. Oh, I said, what's the problem? Well, he said to begin with, last night my wife took off, she left me. He said, I really love my wife, but you know, he said, she's gone and I, I don't know what to do. Well, I only had four or five minutes, you know, and I did what I could to get the gospel across to him and then got praying for him and trusted God did something for him. But otherwise, he was just a guy sitting on a stone wall, right? Why should I bother? He's not related to me. He's Scotch. He's not even Canadian, you know, Steve. If you go looking for people to help, you'll find them everywhere. They're all over the place, you know. We had a conference one time down the States. Ralph and Lucy Terra were there, and, and Leonard Ravenhill was there, and bunch of others, and I was there too, we were all speaking different, at different times, and we had, had a great time. But the others all had to leave before I left, and so I had to conclude Friday, Saturday, and Sunday with the people at this conference. And God led me to bring messages about the love of God, you know. And Friday night, when we had a time of testimony, ho, oh, oh. ho, there must have been 40 people testified. This one thing that got a hold of their hearts. One guy, I'll just mention the one guy, after that meeting when I first brought a message on love, he found he's on the way home, he sees a car parked at McDonald's or someplace, and, and uh, the motor's up, or the lights are up. So he backs up, he goes back in there, he, the door's open, so he turns the lights off, and he goes on his way. He said, no, normally I wouldn't have done that, and he's too bad, he, his bad would be dead. He can take care of that. So he's going along and he sees um, a couple in a car and they're looking at a map, you know. So he pulls over and says, can I help you? Yeah, we're kind of lost, you know. And we've come to a family reunion and we know we're in the right state, but we, we lost the address somehow and we don't know what to do. And he said, well, I know there's a telephone. Can I help? Well, they said, um, yeah, if you can find this guy and his name is Gene, you know, and that's all he had. So he drives up to these telephones, and there's several telephones, and he's in this one, just going to phone them in the next booth. Somebody 
address something called cheating. So he waits until I turn and buzzes up and said, who is this genius? And you know, I know some people that are sitting in the car, they're all, hey, we're looking for them. And he put the whole thing together. You see. So then he goes on to me feeling real good, you know. And he sees uh, two ladies, one was quite old, and she was quite ill in a, in a motorhome. And he pulled in and asked if he could help. And the gal said, well, my mom, she's, uh, you know, she's a diabetic and she's having a stone. I, I don't, know, don't know what to do. Don't you worry, so I'll go and get help. So when God helped him, he told the story, he said, you know what? And then that younger lady, you know, I bet she was, oh, she must have been at least 75. And the lady got up in the meeting and she said, oh, dearie, I'm 85. And this lady was in the meeting, you see. He didn't know that. <laughs> anyway. We have a song, the water is flowing like a river, right? It just doesn't flow too much too easily in the average church today. Some people come to church to look around and make sure we're so and so sitting, just to make sure we don't sit in the same pew. You know what's going to happen when you get to heaven if you do get to heaven? You might have to shine your shoes for a thousand years, you know. I mean, symbolically. Don't go fooling me wrong now. Okay. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of love. Romans 15, 30 speaks about the love of the Spirit. Did you know what was in the Bible? The love of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of love. In Colossians 1, there's a verse that says, Your love in the Spirit. We put the two together, it's powerful, you know. Your love in the Spirit and the love of the Spirit. You know, looking back at the revival in Saskatoon, I would say that the hallmark of the revival was simply love. We heard it again, we heard it a thousand times. There were some, some meanings that were so powerful, you know. The people would be sure, I remember one couple, they said, you know, my wife and I love each other dearly, and we have ever since the day we got married five years ago, but wow, they said, now we're up in the ceiling. I mean, the house is filled with just an ocean of love, you know. We heard this again and again. One gal gave a testimony, and some gal named Alice, who lived in Edmonton, had stolen her wife, and uh, stolen her husband, and so she told us what happened one night. God had dealt with her in the meetings, and so she said, I hated Alice with a passion. I wouldn't let my kids even talk about Alice in Wonderland. I hated that gal. And God dealt with her about it, so she wrote a letter, which she read to the congregation one night, in which she asked Alice, to forgive her for the bitterness she felt towards her. And she assured Alice she'd be praying for her that someday she might come to know the love of God as well. And then she said she made a letter. Nothing ever happened. Her husband never ever came back to her. I lost track of her, you know. Often on, what happened to that gal, you know? And about a year ago, I was holding meetings and I was asked to stay in a certain house. And it was this gal and her husband. Not her original husband, but another husband. And uh, she said, I could hardly wait till you got in the door. I had to tell you what happened since, you know. Anyway, I don't know how she could write the letter, but she did, and she meant it. And God blessed her for it. You know, when you hate somebody, you don't hurt them. You hurt yourself. You don't hurt them. You hurt yourself. And no matter how bad a thing they've done to you, when you look at Calvary, all of this stuff disappears. It doesn't mean anything. Not really. You know, when communism took over in China, they had a period of time when they allowed young people who they call Red Guards, they allowed them to go into homes anywhere in China and they could kill or maim or rob uh, intellectuals and religious people, particularly those two, and wealthy people. And thousands of people died. Until it got so bad, they finally called it off. The government did. In one case, this guy broke into a home with a club and he beat the whole family to death. The father, the mother, but she lived, he didn't know that, and killed all the kids. 
Years later, when it was all over, she found out that the guy who did that was living not two blocks from her place. How did she handle it? She began praying for him, and praying that somehow God could put them together, you know? And it happened this way. She heard that he had a child that was not well, and he had no money, and he couldn't afford a doctor or medical help, and so she went over. She didn't let him know who she was. She just said, I would like to nurse your boy back to health. It won't cost you anything. I'll take care of that if you let me have him for a couple of weeks. And so he was overjoyed because he had a job he had to take care of so on. And so she nursed him back to health and took him back. And he thanked her. And then she told him who she was. You murdered my husband and my children one night. But I forgive you. And he fell on his face on the floor and began to sob. And she led him to Christ, you know. Love, remember, is as strong as death. It's a powerful thing. Use it. We should be using it, dear people, all the time. All the time. All right. If you're not filled with love, you are not filled with the Spirit of God. Some of you probably heard this story before, but a lady came down the aisle in one of my meetings dragging her husband. He was a very unwilling captain, and she got into the front, and then she turns to me and she said, He's a backslider. Talk to him. So I began to talk to him and said, Look, preacher, he said, I'm not ready for this. If I didn't go along with my wife, she tear me apart when we got home, so that's the only reason I'm here, you know. Oh, okay. So I turned to her and said, are you a Christian? Of course I'm a Christian. I said, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. She said, I speak in tongues 30 minutes every day. I said, I didn't ask you to speak in tongues. I asked you if you're filled with the love of God. Well, it's the same thing. Well, it's the same thing. And I began to probe her heart, you know, and God probed her heart. And she broke up in tears and fell on her face, you know, and cried to God, and God renewed her. Now, I don't know what happened between her and her husband. But there are people, I don't care what kind of significant experience you had. If you're not filled with the love of God, it wasn't real. It wasn't from God, you know. Moody prayed for months, six, eight months, walking up and down the streets, crying to God, and he filled with the Holy Spirit. He knew he wasn't. Lord, he had the biggest Sunday school in Chicago at the time. Then he noticed a couple of Methodist ladies sitting on his knees and all, when he was preaching they were always praying and he didn't like that so he asked them what was going on and they said we're praying for him to be filled with the Spirit. That's how it all began really. So then he began meeting with these ladies and praying, you know, and then for six or eight months, just day and night, crying to God. And one day, walking down a certain street in Chicago, he said, I was filled with the Spirit of God. He said, I was so filled with the love of God, I felt I could take the whole world into my heart. He didn't preach any new sermons. He preached the same sermons he'd been preaching before. But now, where before ones and twos were converted, sometimes now hundreds and occasionally thousands would be converted through a single sermon. But remember what he said. I felt as if I could take the whole world into my heart. What about Finney? Finney was just newly converted to came out of the bush after finding Christ as a Savior and sat down beside his fireplace and received a mighty infilling of the Spirit of God. He said, I didn't even know there was such a thing. He never heard of the Holy Spirit, apparently. But that's what God did. Something God did for him. Every person he talked to the following day was converted. He walked into a factory one time. There's 85 people working there. He never said anything. He just walked around looking solemnly at different people. And all of a sudden, people started falling on their knees and praying. And pretty soon, the whole mill quit running. And the whole outfit, they were all on their knees praying. And the, and the guy that ran the place saw what was happening, ran up to get some preachers. I mean, that's power, right? But what did he say about it? Sing it. He said, I felt as if I were being fanned with gigantic wings of love. And went on and on and on for hours. You know. It was a love experience. See. Ever heard of J.B. Earl? Bringing in the sheaves? He wrote a book and a song for I believe. He was an evangelist. 
and not doing very well. Nobody was responding, nobody was getting saved, and he was getting discouraged and thinking of leaving the ministry. But he finally decided, he was invited to go somewhere for 10 meetings, 10 days, and so here's what he did. He said, I made those sermons as hard and hot and tough and rough as I could. I determined to break those people. He said, I put cactus in them and barbed wire and salt and everything you can think of, you know. And I preached nine of my sermons and I was so stirred. So he took the tenth sermon and he reworked it. He put more dynamite in it, you know. And preached it with great fervor and nothing happened. And that night, J.B. Earl was in his room alone and he was talking to God and he said, Lord, what in the world is wrong with those people? And God said, nothing, but it's all wrong with you. Why? Wait a minute, God, he said, I often preach with tears. Yes, he said, but it's water off an iceberg. And J.B. Earl spent several hours on his face before God that night and all he ever said was this, and suddenly, God filled me with the love of Christ. And before he died, 150,000 people found Christ as their Savior in his meetings. See? Again, it was a love experience. You know, in our church in Saskatoon, Gordon Bailey, he was a cattle inspector, grade A education. Six years a Christian, never tried to win a soul to Christ. Didn't even think it was his responsibility. But he was always in church, which is a dangerous thing if you're preaching the Bible, because it can do things later on, maybe not right today, but down the road. And so one day, God got a hold of him, and some of you have heard this before, but what he did, he walked to the front and stood by the communion table. And he said something like this, I've been back sitting for two years, I've been sitting in the back too because I hate some of you people, and I, I sit there and I shoot arrows of hatred in the backs of your heads. And I want to be forgiven and be a real spiritual Christian. Can you forgive me? Well, the congregation all took their heads up and down, and I uh, had my deacons take him off into the side room and pray with him, and he went home. And then he set out five chairs for his wife and his kids, four or five chairs, I forget now. And asked each kid to forgive him for being such a bad Christian, such a poor example of Jesus, Manny said, I have to ask my wife, I've been such a poor, rotten husband, you know, and he got the whole thing taken care of. Then what happened? That night, people that same day, that night, he was walking in the barn, he had a herd of black Angus cattle. And he said, God suddenly filled me with the Holy Spirit from top to toe. He didn't speak in tongues, nothing like this happened. But he knew God had taken over. And he had such a love for people. He started witnessing. He led 30 people to Christ in about nine months. And then he went to an Indian village and got an Indian word going, led 35 Indians to Christ. And then churches began inviting the Lord to come for meetings. I don't think his own family really understood what God was doing with him. It was incredible. He, people, he had meetings in Vancouver where the power of God was so great. Gordon said, I stood there and I shook. I didn't know what to do even. He preached one time, a bunch of people finished the meeting, gave an invitation, two men came forward. He dismissed the congregation, took his men in the back room, came back for third minutes later, the whole congregation still sitting there. Not one person's left. And he sees conviction on every face. So he calls them from the pulpit. And many things like this happened. Then, for one year, he preached 105 times just on weekends. I mean, the power of God was on his life. Not when he got converted, but when he humbled himself under God's hand. And if God is asking you to humble yourself in some way, go ahead and do it. To be a blessing that's for you that you can't even imagine. You know, but what is called the royal law in James 2 verse 8. It's the royal law. It's more important than any other law in the Bible, you know. The royal law, I said before, I'll say it again, let all your things be done with love. Everything. To your wife, your family, your neighbors, everybody. How do we get this kind of love? Spurgeon said, listen carefully, 
Love comes when self dies. Love comes when self dies. Okay, keep that in mind. Very important. We get it from the Lord because the Lord made you, Paul said, the Lord made you to increase and abound and love one toward another toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end that he may establish your hearts on blameful and holiness before God, even the Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. We are not ready for the coming of Jesus if we're not filled with the love of God. And so we need to be praying one for another to this end, as Paul was praying from the others. First of all, four nine says, We're taught of God to love one another. How are we taught? We're taught in three ways. We're taught by command. And first John three says, This is his commandment. Then he gives two commandments. Why didn't he say these are his commandments? He didn't say, he just said, this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as he gave his commandment. In other words, you can't divorce the one from the other. You believe in Christ, you should then automatically become a loving person. This is his commandment. Okay. Example, 1 John 3, 16, hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Okay. By precept, beloved, it says in 1 John, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God. He that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. And in the book of 1 John, there are 12 places, dear people, where love is made the absolute test of reality in the Christian life. 12 places. He that dwells in love dwells in God. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.5 says that love, the goal of our instruction is love rising out of a pure heart, out of a good conscience, and out of a genuine faith. Rising out of a pure heart. Let's begin there. We need to start there. To have a, you can't really love people. It says in First Peter chapter 1, Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto, and the word there in the Greek means motion toward, unto what? Unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently. Then First John, First Peter 4, he says, Have further love among yourselves, for love shall cover the multitude of sins. So a pure heart, Love rises out of a pure heart and then out of a good conscience. Do you have a good conscience? Is there some monetary thing you should take care of? Like a friend of mine, you know, he farmed and he had a caterpillar tractor and uh, just after it was over the warranty period, it went boom. I mean, the, the whole, it meant a brand new unit, you know. So he turned it back. He was a Christian guy, but he turned it back and took it to the dealer and said, look at this, it's still okay, you know, I'm under the warranty, yeah. And so they, they replaced it, you know. But then he was in some revival meetings and the Lord got a hold of him. <laughs> he had a hard time. But you know, finally he went and he did it. He said the guy was very angry and called everything under the sun. But anyway, he made it right. And what happened to him? I don't know anybody I've ever met in 65 years that had such a love for souls as that man had. Do you know what he did one time? He's driving through a village and he had a PA system on his car. And he did this constantly in the summertime, you know, driving up and down the village at two miles an hour, broadcasting the gospel. He gets stopped by a policeman. He said, we have an anti-noise bylaw, and you broke that bylaw, and I arrest you. Oh. And he said, there's a court case this afternoon. We can, you can take care of it right away if you'd like. I go, okay, fine. So he goes, and then it was his turn, and the judge says, well, young man, what have you got to say? Well, he said, the policeman will have to say it. Well, the policeman says, I've told this young man many times, and Bill, his name was Bill Wendell. He stopped. He said, no, wait a minute. We just met today. You didn't tell me many times. You told me once. Uh oh, so he backs off and he gets a little more honest and he tells the story. 
And so the judge says, well, uh, I'll have to fine you $200 for two weeks in jail. And Bill said, uh, sir, I highly respect your office. I refuse to pay the fine, and I will go to jail for two weeks. But I want you to understand this. When I get out of jail, I'll do it again. What do you suppose happened? The judge put his head in the desk, began to cry, and said, John, let him go, let him go. <laughs> then one day he's driving down the road, he sees a bunch of priests and nuns, and they were having some kind of open air time, tables and food and everything in the field, you know? So there's a gate there, so he drives up to the gate, and the guy at the gate, he said, what's going on over there? Oh, he said, it's called a retreat. Oh, Bill said, I, I spoke to retreats many times. Well, he said, would you like to go in? Sure, he said. So the guy that's met him. And he drives up into these priests and nuns, and for a half an hour, he preached the gospel to them. And you know what happened? When he was finished, a bunch of priests came over and thanked him profusely for what he said about Jesus. He traveled with me one winter when we preached in logging camps, and what a blessing, I'm telling you. You get on a bad road sometimes, you know, and sometimes we're on a bad, newly bulldozed road, no snow on it, just roots and stumps and rocks and everything, you know, and you have to drive about three miles an hour to avoid all these obstacles, and we finally bent the tire bar, and we couldn't drive them because we just shot off to one side all the time. Oh, Bill said, that's no problem, so we cut a piece of... Uh, spruce about this long, about this big round, and he climbs underneath, and we got that against the bend in the tie rod, and then I just backed up in the thing and finally got it straightened out, and the way we know. But he was so good with guys, you know, he wasn't afraid of anybody. But he was really filled with the love of God, and you know, more than once, he and some friends put a track to never home in Winnipeg. The first time they did that, I think there were 18 people converted, and I think there were 200 people asked to get a Bible. They had on this track thing they had, if you want to get a Bible, contact us, you know. He did that twice over the years, he and some friends of his. But it all began, you know, when Bill got filled with the love of God. You know. So, when we mentioned we forgot one thing, and a genuine faith, First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.5. Faith, that song, mighty faith, the promise sees and looks to God alone. Last set of possibilities and cries, it shall be done. And cries, it shall, it shall be done. And cries, it shall be done. Last set of possibilities and cries, it shall be done. 7,487 promises in the Bible. Did you know that? No, you say it. The first reaction we get is people say, well, they're not all meant for me. No, so let's chop it in half. Let's say you've got 2,000 promises. Is that enough? Do you need more than that? They're called exceeding great and precious, and they are. You don't have to have money in the bank. You've got these promises in God's bank. And God is waiting for people that will simply believe Him. George Mueller, you know, very highly educated person. He spoke eight languages. He could have been a professor in the university if he wanted to, but he didn't. And God called him to look after kids in Bristol, England. They start off with a dozen kids in a home, wound up with 2,000 kids in an enormous establishment on Ashley Downs in Bristol, England. And there are several books in his life. One is called Delighted in God. You ought to read it. If you haven't read it, your education is not complete. There's other books in his life as well. There's one book, and all it gives, it's a thick book, and all it gives is his day-by-day -day account of answers to prayer, which he had by the thousand. Uh, he, when he was 85, I think he lived to be 94, when he was 85, he had a list of 85,000 prayers that God answered. He kept a prayer ledger, so the prayer he prayed, the day he prayed, the day God answered. He had all this in his book. And he had um, 15,000 prayers that God answered the same day he prayed them. And the others took a little longer, maybe a week or a year or two years or five years or something, you know. He never ever hinted at anybody, and many, many times, in that one larger book, he had nothing for the kids and the staff. He just told God, kept on telling God, and God kept sending it in, sending it in. It's a, it's a, it's a marvelous story, you know. 
delighted in God. And he was simply delighted in God. I don't know that he had any deeper experience, but he learned very early in life that the promises of God are real. They're meant for Christians everywhere, all through this age. He understood that. What an example. You know, he toured the world after he was 70 in those old sailing boats and stuff, you know? No airplanes. Wherever he went, immense crowds. He came on a ship. He was to speak in Montreal, Canada, one Sunday afternoon, but the ship was becalmed in a fog at the mouth of the river there, and there they sat. Well, the captain was a Christian, so Mueller was talking to the captain and said, I haven't been late for an appointment set up by God in 50 years, and I'm not starting today. I have to be in Montreal tomorrow at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, so you better get this half moving on board. And the, and the guy said, Mr. Mueller, you understand the Bible, but you sure don't understand the sea. We may be here for three days, or even a week, you know. Oh, no. You said, no, no. I'm going to pray right now that God will lift the fall. So two of them now, and I read the prayer. It was very short. Dear Lord, I think it would please you to lift the fall for the sake of your work. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for doing it. And then the captain started to pray, and he stopped and said, no, no, he said, you don't need to pray, it's already happened. Besides, you don't believe it's going to happen. What's going to work? And the old no, thought was gone, you know. This happened all through his life, and immense, wonderful things. And we can sit here in, a, in an icebox and say, I don't believe that kind of stuff. And we just reject it. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't reject it. Now, I know for myself, over the years, I wish I kept a record of answers to prayer. My wife and I were down, this is shortly after we married, in this little church I mentioned before, and we didn't have any money, and we didn't have any food, and we were praying. And I went to pick up my mail, and here I got a letter from a relative of mine in England, who sent me a check, you know. And God had to get that thing there at the right time that day, and he did, no problem for God, you know. And we had hundreds of answers to prayer like that. I needed a vehicle. When I started a church in Transformer 45 years ago, I had a bicycle. Somebody loaned me a bike. But the church building I had was then in the country. And I knew I had to have a car, so I told the Lord. Some of the men in the church said, oh, we'll start a car fund. No, I said, you won't start a car fund because God knows all about it. We don't need a car fund, you know. And one day somebody phoned me and said, uh, I'd like you to come and see my wife and I we have something we'd like to give you. And one time he said, we want you to go to Steinbeck and buy a vehicle and we'll pay the whole shop. You know, so they had a new car, you know. And things like this have happened hundreds of times over the years. There are people, it's great, but you know, we don't get anywhere if we're full of unbelief, you know. Faith works by what? It works by love. Let all your things be done with love. Love believes all things. Let's get with it. And let God use us in the measure that He wants. The first fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22 is love. That's the first thing mentioned, you know. Love and then comes joy and other things, but love is first of all. Ephesians 6.23 tells us that both faith and love come from God the Father. It says that in Ephesians 6. Yeah. It comes from God. If you don't have it, ask God to give it to you. But for, you know, Andrew Murray prayed an astonishing prayer one time. I wish I had it here, I don't have. It was a prayer that began this way, Dear God, empty me. Empty me of myself. And then fill me with your love. Fill me full, he said, to overflowing. Fill me with love and kindness to everybody I meet anywhere, at any time. And then the prayer went on like this, you know, sentence after sentence. And somebody wrote a book on his life called The Apostle of Abiding Love. Choi was the author of that book. A tremendous book. This man was so filled with the love of God, you know. And love attempts great things to the glory of God. Did you know that we Christians are supposed to provoke each other? Did you know that? I see a couple of heads going up and down. Okay, so it's nothing new, eh? Hebrews chapter 10 says we're to provoke one another to love and to good works. Okay? Are we doing that? Are we? 
provoking one another to love the good works. I'm doing that right now, of course. It's not the only time I do it. Provoke one another to love and to good works. If you see a Christian is faltering, they're not getting anywhere, and they're not really involved, they don't love anybody, you, you want to work on it, right? Exhort one another daily, it says in Hebrews 3. It says it again in Hebrews chapter 10. Exhort one another daily. When was the last time you exhorted a brother or sister in Christ? Have you ever done this? But the Bible says daily. We're supposed to be out of all time. And if we don't do it, notice what it says in Hebrews chapter 3. Exhort one another daily what is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. If we're not doing this, Christians in our assemblies are going to get hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Exhort one another daily. Okay. Provoke one another to love and to good works. Are you involved in any good work? Uh, Paul wrote to Titus and he said, Be careful to remind the people that have believed in God that they maintain good works. As a Christian believer, every Christian believer should be involved in some kind of good work somewhere. It could be praying for missionaries. It could be writing to missionaries. We've been in the mission field many times and you know, Many times, missionaries have told us that it's just longing to get a letter from home. And somebody's writing to say, we love you and we're praying for you, you know. And sometimes you don't get that. But there, there's some way in which every Christian can be involved in some good work. Remember, we're taught of God to love one another. We're taught of God. Are we listening to God? Well, we certainly need to be. Okay. Paul, Philippians 1 9. This I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without offense until the day of Christ. So, okay, this I pray. We should be praying for one another and be filled with the love of God. Remember what did Moody say? This is where we've gone wrong in our churches. This is where we've gone wrong. You know. I was a district worker for a group of 60 churches at one time, and I did a lot of traveling and had to, you know, deal with church problems. It wasn't very exciting. And the little trifles that some people would seize on, you know, and they didn't care if they upset the whole assembly. They didn't care. You know. They were going to have their miserable little way or else this kind of stuff you know I'll just give you one example pastor in Kenora, Ontario he was an American fellow pastor in the Baptist Church in Kenora and he said you better come down he said uh, the Russians have the Americans on the run I said what do you mean he said there's a Russian guy in my congregation he's giving me a hard time okay so I drove out I met with this couple this Russian couple I'm sure they were Christians and so I asked this man, I said, now I understand you have, you're angry with the pastor, what was the reason? Ah, he said, because he baptized people not born again. I said, pastor, did you not know, know of anything like that? And so this guy mentions a certain lady that he baptized, and so the pastor, well, she's certainly a born again believer. No, no, he said, she got this red stuff on her lips, she's not born again. <laughs> Then I did a mean thing. I said, so this red stuff on her lips, that's the reason for all this problem. I said, well, it's a funny thing. I see you're wearing red socks. You're sitting on a red Chesterfield. You drive a red car. What about that? Well, then he didn't know what to say, so he turned his wife into a little cried on each other's shoulder for a while. I wasn't, they didn't really get settled, you know. They left the church over that. But there's little things going on, you know. I love so well, no, no, no. That's not the window. I don't know. 
I wonder sometimes if Tozer wasn't right when he said only 20% of the people in the evangelical church are born again. I don't know where he got the figures, and I'm not going to quote them as being definite, but there's certainly something wrong. By love, serve one another. All, all through my life, serve one another, you know. Through love. People keep saying, when are you going to retire? Retire? How do you spell that word? You know. Why should I retire? I told the Lord, I'd be willing to have to be 106 as long as I can teach and preach, you know, and live the Christian life. I think that'd be great. If I get to 106, I'll ask about 115, you know. <laughs> I don't know what'll happen. He might call me today or tomorrow. Who knows? But retire? To do what? <laughs> to watch TV? Oh, come on. That's the dead stuff, you know. But to pray and see God at work. Yeah. Oh, you know, we're <laughs> after meetings. I had a song leader with me, and uh, they brought a girl. She was probably 18 or so, and they said that she's crying, but she won't tell us what the problem is. See if you can help her. So we talked to her. She wouldn't say a word, you know. So I told her, you know, sister, are you a Christian? She went like this, and I said, why don't you tell us what the problem is? Then we can help you. And she finally got frustrated and jumped her feet and rallied. They brought her back the next night. And the same thing happened. They brought her to me, you know. So I'm sitting there talking and I said, why don't you tell us what the problem is? And then she began and she said, uh, I can't talk. I can't talk. Oh, I asked her to forgive us. We didn't know she couldn't talk. I said, have you ever thanked God that you can't talk? And she shook her head violently. Now she you know what the Bible says in the book of Exodus? Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the dumb of the deaf for the seeing of the blind? Have not I the Lord? I said, God made your mouth the way it is. Why don't you thank him for it? Ooh. You know. We kept gently urging her. And finally she went like this. I said, okay, now you pray and talk to the Lord. And thank him for what he gave you. So she didn't pray a lot, so, but she prayed. And then we drove her home. And on the way home, she started to talk. She was in the back seat. She started to sing hymns. And she was praising the Lord all over the country. You know? And my father said, hey, Bill, do you hear what I hear? I said, yes, shut up, man. Let her go, you know. <laughs> and uh, Months later, I got a letter from her. She told me about all the problems she had in her life because she was angry at God for what he done to her, you know. And she said, I got them all dealt with, you know. She said, it's just great. And it is great. And then a gal came one time. She was a Southern Baptist gal when she was in the university in Saskatoon and she had serious problems. And I discovered she'd been into some occult junk, so we dealt with that. And she really repented. And then it was time to pray. And so... I began to pray. And Jesus came. I can't explain what happened except that she saw the Lord Jesus standing there beside her. And she cried and pointed to him and said, Can you see him? Can't you see him? Look how wonderful he is. Look, look he's just touched me. He's healed me. He's healed me. He wasn't put on. I stood there like a dumb dog. I didn't see anything. You don't have to see. You know he's there. But if you don't get into it, you don't venture on anything, you won't see anything either. Remember faith, mighty faith, the promises, and looks to God alone, laughs at impossibilities, and cries, it shall be done. You know, my wife and I went, and it was the first time we're off the North American continent in Buenos Aires, Argentina, a city of 10 or 12 million people, and nobody met the plane. The only Spanish I knew was C. <laughs> So we're waiting, you know. We found out later on the contact man I had, he had just moved to Buenos Aires from Santiago, Chile, and nobody knew him in, in Buenos Aires, and uh, he never got my last two letters. He said, did you use a big stamp on, a, on your letter? I said, yeah, I did. Why? Well, he said, in the post office here, if they like the stamp, they take the letter home. And we, we never got your last two letters. <laughs> well, I had his phone number in my pocket. And I couldn't find it. it wasn't there anymore. I think an angel stole it or something. And so here we are in this city. We don't know the language. What in the world are we going to do? Panic? 
Now we're fighting. You know what happened? A guy walks up, a man about 50, speaking perfect Spanish, and I let him know, my amigo, Lyle Eggleston, my told we can't, he grabbed the phone, I said, no, no, he has not, I didn't know then, but I found later on he had an unlisted phone, but we tried to phone him, he wasn't listed. So he bowed to me, and he walked in the little circle, came back and handed me a slip of paper. And then the slip of paper was Lyle Eggleston's name, his phone number, and his address. And while he turned down, I told him what happened. He said, Bill, listen, nobody in the city even knows me. Nobody, you know. I just got here. And I showed him the paper. He couldn't believe it. He said, Spanish people, they can't spell my last name, Eggleston. He used to be a cancerous convoy, but that was his name, Lyle Eggleston. He said, they can't pronounce it, they can't spell it. It was properly spelled. So it came to the only conclusion there was that an angel had come, that God had sent an angel. You know, we have numbers of things like that happening in foreign countries. It doesn't happen here, maybe because we don't expect it to happen. We've got so many resources and auxiliaries here in Canada, we don't need it. But you see it in other countries sometimes, you know, as you walk with God. You see His power in His hand. Okay. Characteristic of true love. Love seeks not her own. That's the best definition of love I can find anywhere in the Bible. Whatever it is, it never seeks its own. It's always seeking, look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. We're not supposed to seek our own things, but every man is supposed to seek the welfare of others. 1 Corinthians 10, 24. Okay, so love seeks not her own. She's always looking for someone else to bless, and someone else to help, and someone else to encourage. That's how it should be. That's what revival is all about, dear people. When a true revival comes, this is what happens. When I think back, you know, as to say to my honey, you know, I could die happy any day. I got so many things, I think back with things that God did, things that God, I just happened to be there. And God did these things. Oh. And we doubt it? How can we? Let no man seek his own. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 24. Philippians 2, 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. But Paul said this, and he's talking about Christians. All seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. How do I know he's talking about Christians? Because the context goes like this. I have no man like-minded who will mentally care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. So the same problem as we have today. Christians living selfishly, not really concerned about the work of God. If you're not tithing, sir, that's God's. If you don't do it, then you're robbing God. It says so. And how can you rob God and get away with it, you know? It's a starting point. And it's a test to faith, too. Okay. We're supposed to prove the sincerity of our love, the proof of your love, Paul said, now boasting in your behalf. And so part of them boasting about some congregations, the wonderful way they were serving God and loving God and loving one another. And he saw this is a proof of their love. The way they were giving not just money but themselves to others. Okay. Love is as strong as death, right? That's what it says. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And then I want to read something in closing. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not love, I am become a clanging gong, or a clashing cymbal. I'm just a noise. God said about Pharaoh, king of Israel, he's just a noise. He's just a big noise. That's all. You know, in the minor prophets, God spoke about praying. He called it howling. You've not cried me when you howled on your beds. He called singing howling in the temple. Our singing can be howling. Our praying may be howling. 
a preaching, maybe nothing, maybe a clanging gong or a clashing cymbal, just a noise. That's how it is, people, if we're not truly commandeered by the love of God. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. That's a good starting place. I am nothing. Though I be so all my goods to feed the poor and Lord give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. It profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love doesn't envy, doesn't vaunt itself or push itself forward, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. In all these human situations, love never fails. Great to know that. Okay. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abides, now he's talking about abiding gifts. You see, in the chapter before, chapter 12, he talked about all the gifts of the Spirit. And then by saying, cover earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a far better way. And the far better way is to seek not for spiritual gifts, but to be seek to be filled with the love of God. And now abides faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. That's all I have.